So hello everyone. Thank you for finding time and joining today's session of the uh, Life in Kyrgyzstan conference. I hope that the power breaks, power cuts that we are having today in Bishkek, they, it will not disturb the session. Uh, my name is Akalai Muktarbek Kazi, and I am an assistant professor at the economics department of the American University of Central Asia. Our session today is devoted to the social impact <clears throat> of migration and remittances. And the topic of migration and remittances has been one of the most discussed and important topics uh, in the country for more than a decade for a reason. Uh, according to different sources, from 600,000 to 800,000 Kyrgyz citizens work in Russia. And it is like 20% of the economically active population. Migration has produced broad impacts of most aspects of life in Kyrgyzstan. And it is transforming family life of households with migrants in many different ways. Migration brings number of trade-offs and challenges for families, including separation of a family member, additional responsibilities placed on those who remain at home, but it is also an important source of income for many households. We have three speakers today with very interesting presentations of the research projects that they do, uh, which are related to the social impact of migration and remittances. Uh, each speaker has 20 minutes for their presentations and 10 more minutes uh, for discussion. And I want to ask the audience to send your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom so that after their presentation, speakers can uh, answer your questions. And uh, dear speakers, I want to remind you that I will warn you loudly five minutes and one minute before the end of the allocated time. And I hope that we will have a very nice and lively discussion. So the first presenter is Asungul Kanatbekova. She is a recent graduate of a master's study, population and development of higher school of economics. And she is a research assistant for the OBOR CIS projects of 2020 Global Mobility of Talent Research Group. Her research interests are mainly focused on poverty, labor migration, and the impact of labor migration on left behind households and communities. Asunguru, please start your presentation. You have 20 minutes for your vote. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Akalai. Uh, can you see my slides, my presentation? Yes. Okay. Dear colleagues, good afternoon. Um, I'm Aslubul Kanadbekova, and uh, I'm here to present my research paper on migration impact on health and labor of children left behind in the case of Kyrgyzstan. And I would like to thank organizers to provide me the opportunity to present my research paper here. So, uh, as you might know, migration has a very different effect on uh, left behind family, left behind children, and it has both negative and positive sides. Uh, and the aim of this research is to find out whether migration has effect on the well being of children by two dimensions by health and child labor. So basically, uh, my presentation will be uh, in five parts mainly. So first, I will, I'm going to talk about uh, background of this issue and the motivation behind this research uh, about empirical literature, empirical model and data results and the limitation recommendations. So um, with existing evidence and literature, I was uh, asking, um, I came to this question like, uh, does migration compensate the absence of household member for the uh, family left behind or uh, make migration or maybe migration makes even uh, sometimes worse for family left behind and um, priori uh, effect of migration is not clear and it depends on the two on the balance of two mechanisms. So first mechanism is uh, that migration um, 
according to new um, new economy of labor migration migration is decision taken by a group of people by the household or family and mostly uh, they motivated to bring additional resources like financial resources to home uh, uh, through remittances to maximize their uh, income assets of household so first mechanism is that uh, migration will bring additional resources like financial social remittances that will bring uh, that will ease budget constraints of household and uh, it will increase um, it will uh, contribute to the um, expenditures of household and also in sometimes in some cases it also uh, increase investments in healthcare, in education, and in business sector. Uh, but the second mechanism is that absence of uh, is the negative effect of the absence of household member. As you might know, that uh, migration is most migrants are mostly economically active population that uh, has very big contribution to the household labor market, labor production, for example. And they are when they are gone to migration uh, household uh, loses labor production it will uh, decrease income first of all and um, maybe it also um, will impair care on dependence family members like elderly people um, children and also it increased burden and responsibility for work uh, for children and left behind family, both inside of household for household course, uh, I mean, and outside of household for like uh, job for payment job. <clears throat> and the research question of this uh, work is what effect does migration of household member have on health outcomes and labor of children left behind? Um, and here it's a very crucial uh, thing like why like Kyrgyzstan, as Akhle already said, uh, that um, there is a varied range of um, migrant population from Kyrgyzstan from 600 to 800. But uh, accordingly to uh, State Service of Migration in 2020, there was, they uh, estimated that um, more than 800,000 citizens are uh, working abroad and it's only official data. Under <clears throat> official data some, uh, mainly undermines the re real uh, numbers of migrants. And uh, according to Life in Kyrgyzstan in 2013 uh, survey, uh, nearly every six household had at least one migrant abroad. And Obviously, it has impact on the left behind uh, family, left behind children and elderly people, um, <clears throat> elderly people and um, yeah, and uh, society is very uh, like dependent, society and country is very dependent on labor migration. Um, and here I was thinking that um, Kyrgyzstan has also reported on very higher risk of uh, children malnourishing uh, their nutritional um, risk of being uh, badly nutritioned and uh, child poverty is reported more than 30 percent by UNICEF in 2015 and also uh, Kyrgyzstan children in school age from between 5 and 17 years old uh, 27 percent of them are participate in labor and uh, about 90 percent of them work in agricultural sector as you might know um, Migrants mostly come from in Kyrgyzstan. Migrants come, mostly come from rural areas, where agriculture is the main uh, labor market for them. So I was thinking maybe uh, uh, child. Yeah, I was thinking that uh, maybe migration has impact on child poverty too in Kyrgyzstan. So uh, it's very um, crucial and actual topic because uh, now there are. Um, increasing number of left behind children in Kyrgyzstan and uh, maybe not all the time they met their basic needs for grown children and uh, also uh, also like society is highly uh, society's life highly determined by labor migration there is still gap in literature and evidence that uh, research that analyzed migration impact on child uh, development so, and best of my knowledge, uh, this study is uh, the first study that contributes to the migra migration impact on child labor in the context of Kyrgyzstan. So, um, 
here's the uh, I will just briefly look to uh, go through the empiric empirical literature. Uh, firstly, is migration impact on health. Mostly uh, literatures, uh, evidences used anthropometric outcomes of health. And uh, they like two camps of researchers that first of them find that found that uh, migration has positive effect on child health. Uh, the second of them found um, negative effect. But also I forgot that there is also a third that has a very fluctuated impact of migration on children. Like maybe initially it has negative effect, uh, positive effect, and then it has negative effect is like uh, inverse U-shaped, for example. And, um, and uh, worthy to note that um, in Kyrgyzstan, in the context of Kyrgyzstan, there are uh, two studies by the same authors, uh, Kruger and Anderson. They found that uh, migration has negative effect on the health of children left behind, like uh, children from a migrant household most likely to be thin. So, and migration in child labor is also, uh, some researchers found negative, some uh, effects, some of them found uh, positive effects. Um, yeah, and uh, mostly child labor is uh, coming from the time allocation that um, children, instead of going to school, they spend time um, in order to spend time in work, uh, in order to um, earn more money. So uh, this is the empirical model. Um, empirical model, I used uh, difference in different uh, research methods. Uh, mainly, difference in difference is basically utilized for, to, this, to see the uh, causal effect of some um, policy or um, program intervention by comparing two groups, by comparing uh, two groups, control and treatment group. Treatment group is that group that had received um, treatment, uh, like policy targeted group and control that had uh, didn't uh, receive any, uh, any policy treatment. And they uh, difference in difference basically compares uh, the estimations of uh, two groups before and after treatment was implemented. In this case, in the in the case of this study, the treatment is migration, and treatment group is the household with migrants. In the end line, end line is the post post treatment time, and uh, control group is the group that uh, had not migrants at all in uh, in end line and baseline. So. Uh, and also difference in difference uh, was chosen by me by two main reasons that uh, migration is very um, subjected to selection bias because uh, migrants are not random people from random households. Um, that's why difference in difference uh, reduce uh, the threat of selection bias because in the baseline it takes um, both control and treatment group needs to have equal estimations, equal characteristics. So, and the, and the second reason is that I used life in Kyrgyzstan data in this study. That's why it makes possible to estimate post and uh, pre and post migration uh, periods uh, with panel data. So the equation is following. We can see from here that uh, y is outcome takes uh, three um, outcomes is like health two of them are for health outcomes and one is for child labor uh, also um, it's very important to note that control variables i added control variables to see to have very um, like uh, better explained model and i took as child characteristics age and sex of child uh, household characteristics like the number of household member number of children under age 18 under age 5 allocation of household and logarithm of household income um, also uh, household head characteristics uh, sex and level of education and uh, in the child labor regression i added uh, additional uh, control variables is like um, livestock and land ownership um, health outcomes were estimated in OLS regression and child labor in Tobit because um, not every child has uh, like variables of child labor is uh, most of them were equal to zero and in order to minimize the shift into one side I used Tobit. 
So uh, the data is a lot set I used life in Kyrgyzstan. In the time when I did this work, it had uh, five years round table, round uh, panel survey. And um, it's represented at micro, meso, and macro levels at whole country. And um, it was uh, important to see um, in which year, in which of the five years, there was uh, the larger number of migration from households uh from the household that had not uh, that hadn't migrant at all so i checked and to, in 2011 there was a larger number of migration from households uh, equal to 177 households sent migrant abroad and i took uh just 2011 as end line and just previous year as baseline you can see from this table the sample size of children for the years for the location gender and treatment and control groups. Uh, the interesting uh, case was with uh, definition of child labor. There is no universal definition, but uh, international labor migration, according to international labor migration, um, child labor is not any activity but done by child labor or child, but uh, activity that um, deprives childhood, uh, violates its dignity and um, prevents child from acquiring human capital. And that's why um, I looked through the all variables and found that uh, there's question in life in Kyrgyzstan, uh, like how many weeks in the last academic year your child missed the school? And there was main reasons for child to miss the school. Uh, and among them, there was work to support family and agricultural works that uh, prevent children go to school. So I took uh, those two, um, not variables, but questions as a, a child labor and uh, defined as a missed weeks in school in the last academic year due to agricultural work and work to support family. Uh, child labor were estimated for the children aged uh, between six to 17 in school age. And also uh, it's important that migrant household is household that has currently in the past 11 months uh, migrant abroad for more than a month for job purposes. Um, and health outcomes, uh, most of literature evidence is used anthropometric uh, health outcomes like height for age, weight for, uh, weight for age, BMI, uh, upper arm circumference, for example. And uh, anthropometric health outcomes is basically a quantitative uh, method of measuring um, physical well-being of children. And it can uh, tell about... Okay, and it can tell about the uh, child is at risk or not. And you can see the following equation for this. And health outcomes were estimated only for children aged six, by, uh, six to 12, because in life in Kyrgyzstan, the data for children above 12, 12 years old uh, missed. So uh, baseline outcomes, uh, I just want to show you the graphic that uh, in 2010, both control and treatment groups had basically same uh, estimations for the weight and hate for age for the children. So they didn't differ uh, significantly. So this is the main results of my work. Uh, first, it's about child labor. I'm sorry for the numbers, but you can, I just highlighted and read the most um, important things is that I found that uh, migration has significant impact on child labor. Uh, Children from migrant household tend to work two weeks, more than two weeks, more than uh, children from non-migrant households after migration was done. So, well, it was obvious because um, when migration is done, household is uh, household has reduced income and they need to reimburse it. That's why they uh, decide to send children, child to work instead of going to school. And, uh, and the second assumption that could be that um, children might think that children and household might think that uh, ch child will pursue the migration path. That's why it's not so important to acquire uh, education knowledge. Um, and it's also um, depend on the country of destination of migrant. In Russia, for example, where more than 80% of Kyrgyz migrants work, uh, net return for the education is very low. That's why the motivation to acquire like study knowledge is very low. 
that's why they uh, decide to acquire more skills. And I found that it's very, uh, younger children are exposed to child labor after migration was done is higher than for older children. And uh, girls are exposed also more than boys. Um, and urban, in urban areas, children uh, tend to increase working uh, weeks more than uh, children in rural areas. So if I, it will be questions, I will explain why, but uh, let's go further because of time uh, restrictions. So, but unfortunately, <laughs> I hadn't found any significant effect of um, migration to health of children left behind. So further, I will explain maybe why I think so. So this is the summary that migration associates with the increase in child labor and decrease in school attendance. Uh, as a result of migration, girls deprive more than boys in school attendance. Well, maybe it's also uh, could be the for the reason that uh, of gender roles in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, also, the younger children are affected more than more from migration. And so, yeah, we can skip that. Uh, about limitations, I already told that um, um, life in Kyrgyzstan has no data for the children above tw tw 12 years old. And maybe it will be better to have it and to see how it uh, affects uh, to older children for adolescents and for um, younger children. And recommendation why uh, assumptions that why uh, there, there was no impact of migration to health. Maybe that's uh, further, I, uh, it should be better to categorize outcome variables like uh, less malnourished, less stunted. Uh, children and more stunted children, like for example, like this, and include more variables that can explain health outcomes like uh, parental characteristics, social demographic of their social demographic characteristics, uh, for example, nutritional uh, uh, variables, and uh, also life in Kyrgyzstan make it possible to examine the effect of migration in. Uh, mid-term and long-term perspective as well, because in this study I just used two years and it, uh, it was sort of uh, like short-term effect of migration on children's well-being. And maybe implement matching procedure for the further uh, space of research in this, uh, in this uh, uh, issue. Um, and for the programmers, uh, for the uh, policymakers, I would advise to uh, consider the whole household in the migration process and develop comprehensive policy approaches like that will consider the migrant in destination country and family members in origin uh, country. So basically, this is my presentation and it was uh, five years uh, since I submitted this work as my master thesis. And now I'm working on the migration effect on the uh, emotional behavior of children left behind. So basically this, thank you. This reference, <laughs> yeah. That's it. Thank you, Asungul. It was really interesting and um, insightful. We have one question from the audience. Спасибо, Асунгул. Это была очень интересная презентация. Хотя ее, наверное, надо будет обновить. У меня вопрос касательно вот того, что вы сказали, что может быть именно рост рост того, что дети работают больше, когда вот родители уезжают в миграцию за границу из-за того, что они должны восполнить затраты на миграцию родителей. Да? А у меня вот именно такая перспектива, именно взгляд на то, что мне кажется, что рост именно в работе происходит из-за того, что родители как раз-таки уезжают бросают детей на попечение своих родственников, и они уезжают вдвоем, то есть муж и жена. И, соответственно, родственники больше заинтересованы именно в работе детей своих родственников-мигрантов, нежели детей своих собственных. Поэтому здесь может быть и такая интерпретация, вы согласны с этим или нет, и может быть ваша именно ваш анализ и дата показывает, что это происходит именно из-за того, что вы вот сделали да, вот объяснение. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, thank you, Nazik, for the question. It was very interesting. Um, I want to say about uh, my study that it does not allow to see uh, the uh, difference between the attitude toward migrant uh, children and the, ch and the own children of their relatives that they were left. For example, children were left. And I, I would say that mostly children are left behind with their um, grandparents, for example. And in this case, there are, uh, and you know that in Kyrgyzstan, we have very like a collective society that lives together with their grandparents, with their aunts, uncles, with children. And maybe that, that could be also case, but it needs uh, some data analysis for that. And I, can, I, I cannot say the specific things about this, but I want to say that when children are left behind with their grandparents, there are two outcomes of their behavior that grandparents can spoil them either spoil them very but uh, in sometimes they can very violate them uh, so those two outcomes could be possible it's uh, according to qualitative data uh, qualitative researchers in this topic yes thank you thank you uh, we have some comments from murat Piak. murat Piak, please give your comments to us all right yeah thanks so much for this uh, wonderful presentation uh the first comment is about the health outcomes um it might be possible that uh, uh, due to remittances being sent uh, the nutrition value in the household may somewhat increase and so you are not seeing uh, improvements uh, in the height and weight or other uh, physiometric measures um so that's just so what I'm thinking. Another comment is regarding uh, your upcoming research, uh, which is on the social and emotional well being, uh, which is extremely important. Uh, um, however, survey data uh, is very difficult to obtain on this topic. And so um, I, I wonder what are some of the uh, questions that you might be able to glean from the LIK survey? Um, and if um, you don't mind taking yet another aspect, it would be great to see impacts on education as well. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mordok, for questions. So um, about remittances, as I understand, you uh, want to ask how like um, remittances will increase nutritional uh, outcomes of uh, children left behind. That's why it, it doesn't show the significant effect, migration. As I uh, did, I understand, correct? Yeah, that's precisely the case. Okay. Um, you know, uh, as I already told that um, I just analyzed one year effect of migration. So I was thinking maybe also it will be good to see the long-term effect maybe uh, health anthropometric health outcomes of children uh, doesn't react very quickly to changes and it takes time to see the effect maybe in uh, after like two years or three years it ha it will be have very significant effect and the second thing about emotional well-being um i was thinking that uh there is Emotional behavior of children can be like uh, estimated by two, by subjective well-being or by the objective which will uh, be uh, answered, questioned by um, parents, by teachers, for example. Um, that's why in this case, there is no data, I think, uh, yet from life in Kyrgyzstan data uh, that I can uh, say, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, for example, like Dem Demirson and can tell me uh, if they are planning, maybe implement some questions like this. And I would say that uh, questions maybe will be about uh, stress behavior, about their socializing in school, for example, like uh, more broadly, systematically, uh, about their like uh, thoughts of um, self-esteem, for example. And about third, uh, about education is a very crucial topic for the children well-being. Uh, and in, in the context of Kyrgyzstan, it was a uh, few studies that uh, implemented these studies. So uh, maybe in the future, I will also think about this. Thank you. Um, given some reference was made to my name, um, 
I'd like to add that in the last wave, 2019, um, we collected data from youth uh, aged 13 to 17. Uh, it was um, kind of requested from the University of Central Asia to look at the youth perceptions and behavior, etc. So it kind of partly solves the data demand. But if you have time to join tomorrow, uh, for the last session at the conference, we can discuss more and think about in future what type of data would be useful. But largely, it's difficult to collect data from children. Yeah, I mean, if you really want to look at your psychological issues, and probably a separate, specific, oriented survey could be done. We are trying to do a lot in this study, so at some point we should definitely think about quality and quantity type. Thank you. Thank you, Damir. Uh, we have some time for one question only. Uh, Alexandra, please be brief with your question. Asungul, please be brief with your answer. Uh, thank you for organizing this panel. So I'm focusing on uh, research of Kyrgyz diaspora. So my question related to this topic, have you uh, thinking uh, about comparison of the second generation um, diaspora kids uh, who um, kids of migrants who uh, live with them in other country to compare with the kids in Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I wasn't thinking about this question, but you know, there are researchers that found in Tonga that um, children that accompany with their parents, they have better of uh, health outcomes than compare the children left behind. It's obvious because uh, if uh, parents, migrant parents can take their children with them, then they have more income assets in this nation country so they can all, uh, afford uh, the, themselves to take, bring additional member, uh, household members. So in the case of Kyrgyzstan, there was, uh, no, I, I don't want, I didn't think about, but it was very, it's a very interesting topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we should proceed and have our uh, next speaker. So our next speaker is Ainura Smailova. Ainura Smailova is a PhD student at the Corvinus University of Budapest, Hungary. She holds her master's in sociology from the Bishkek Humanities University. And currently she is a teaching assistant at the Corvinus University of Budapest. She also conducts seminars for bachelor students on foundations of sociology class. And her research areas are return migration, migrants, children in Kyrgyzstan, and gender issues. Uh, Anura will present her work on post-migration living difficulties of return women in Kyrgyzstan. So Anura, please start. You have 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Akulai, for a nice presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, like Akalai said, I'm a PhD student at the Corvins University of Budapest, and I'm participating live in Kyrgyzstan conference for the first time. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers for providing this uh, platform to present my presentation. So today I will just present uh, today I will just present my research proposal, uh, and hopefully. Next year, if Life in Kyrgyzstan conference will take place again, uh, I can present the outcomes of my study, the results of my study. So I'm at an early stage of my data collection. So again, I will just present my research proposal uh, for you. Uh, so my research proposal, I'm proposing to uh, study post-migration living difficulties of returned women in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, why why I choose this topic? Uh, as Akalai and Asalgul already mentioned, uh, since we got our independence, uh, it's almost 30 years now, labor migration and international migration is not a new phenomenon for Kyrgyzstan. And today, uh, according to this uh, official statistic, over uh, 700,000 labor migrants from Kyrgyzstan work in Russia. But according to uh, other resources, uh, there are more than 1 million. And, uh, 
And Kyrgyzstan has the highest share of uh, women in migration. It's around uh, 40%. It's, uh, this number is very high uh, for, for uh, Central Asian countries. And uh, you can see that uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan having less than uh, 20%. And uh, female migrants' contribution is uh, huge, both in destination countries and uh, uh, in the home country as well. So uh, they, uh, despite the fact that they earn less than male migrants do, they tend to remit a larger share of their earnings uh, to their home communities. And uh, when they return home, uh, they face uh, specific challenges and difficulties. For example, in uh, 2000, uh, in 2016 and 17, uh, IOM conducted a study on returned migrants with re-entry ban status to the Russian Federation in Kyrgyzstan, and uh, they have identified that uh, women to be one of the most vulnerable groups of returned migrants. Also, uh, there was a joint research uh, by uh, UN Women and UNIFEM, IOM in 2017. They also uh, documented that migrant women who returned home to their communities are also facing uh, stigmatization, status loss, and estrangement from their spouses and children also. And this in turn create behavioral, emotional, and social difficulties. Uh, Also, um, uh, so in order to uh, fuse understand these difficulties, needs, uh, and vulnerabilities of these uh, returned women, uh, I would like to conduct a qualitative study. And uh, for that, uh, for my primary data, I'm going to do life inter I mean, narratives with uh, returned women. And also, uh, I'm planning to interview the key informants from the uh, uh, key informant interviews with representatives of state ministries and agencies at the regional and city level, also with NGOs uh, who are focusing on migrant, migrant women. Also, uh, I will interview family members of the returned migrant women as well. So this will be my uh, primary, primary data. And for the secondary data, of course, I will use the National Statistic Statistical Committee of the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, Life in Kyrgyzstan data from the latest one from 2016, which is already available, and uh, data from 2019, uh, which is... Uh, uh, Professor Resina Leif will uh, briefly present tomorrow, and hopefully the, they will be an access for that data too. Uh, and also annual reports, uh, social indicators, databases, working documents of the UN agencies, UNFPA, IOM, IOO, uh, and others. And also uh, data and reports of local and uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, on the issues of mig migrant women in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so my research questions, uh, so these research questions were designed uh, before the pandemic. And now given this uh, situation with uh, pandemic, I will uh, revise it a bit, I will modify uh, them again. So uh, the main research question is, uh, what was the post-return experience of female returned migrants in Kyrgyzstan? And some related uh, questions will be, why did migrant women return? Uh, uh, was it difficult to adapt, integrate upon return? And uh, did the family benefit from the migration of a female spouse or mother? Uh, were the family members of returned female migrants supportive or not? Uh, did the women face stigmatization upon return? Uh, what factors contribute to return home for these women? And what factors hinder to return home for these women? Uh, I will also analyze um, like, uh, questions on migration topic. So, uh, 
So these are the questions and also the questions on the remittances also. Uh, and so, like I said, little is known about the, uh, about the experiences, uh, about the uh, needs and uh, of returned female migrants and uh, whether there are any uh, support for better integration and adaptation from the government part. Uh, so therefore, uh, I would like to conduct this uh, research, to conduct this study. And uh, if I, I will also appreciate and uh, if there are any recommendations and suggestions to successfully carry out my research, if, uh, if you have any insights, uh, please share. Thank you. So my uh, research proposal is not that uh, long because like I said earlier, uh, I do not have any findings and results yet. So uh, I'm at an early stage of my data collection. So that is why uh, it's shorter than the presentations of other speakers of today's uh, conference. Thank you, Aymura. Um, dear audience, if you have any questions or comments, please use the Q&A function of the Zoom. And uh, well, as we don't have any questions yet, I want to ask my questions. So first of all, um, what type of return women migrants you're going to focus on? Like, will you consider any women or you will focus on the on women who went there alone, leaving their husbands at home and then they returned back? Uh, or you, will you consider women who migrated with their husbands and then they returned back, but their husbands are still there? Because I think depending on this like marital status situation of a woman, the difficulties and challenges they might face will be very different than like the reasons why they return. Uh, thank you, Akulai, for the question. Uh, initially, I was thinking uh, interviewing only those women, uh, those returned women who were breadwinners themselves, who left their household on their own, and whose uh, spouses and children were left behind and uh, uh, who have returned uh, for the last like one or two years. But uh, I was also suggested uh, that uh, to compare uh, those returned women who uh, accompanied their husbands and stayed uh, in the Russian Federation and returned uh, just because their spouses decided so, but not uh, that was their own decision. So it's always a dilemma for women who are on labor migration, whether to return home or not, uh, because they want to generate more income. And uh, for some uh, labor migrants, the empirical study shows that it's even a prestige to be a labor migrant and uh, to stay abroad and uh, kind of support their family financially. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. And another question is related to some um, plans. So when are you going to start your field work? Because um, I think now, I mean, this year and probably the beginning of the next year, or maybe the entire 2021, the reasons for migrants to return home will mm -hmm. be a bit different than uh, the usual reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Because of pandemic and the crisis that is like related to that. So uh, when are you planning to do your field work and how you are going to actually consider this shock period and then like the difference in this reasoning? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, according to the uh, university requ requirement, we have to start our data collection and um, to report on our progress or on our work on, uh, I mean, in December or January. Uh, 
and uh, you are right yes that's why uh, i said that research questions were designed before the pandemic so now i will revise them again and include questions for those who returned uh, because of pandemic and uh, this question will fall under the category of those who returned uh, because of crisis I see that those uh, returned uh, migrants as well. Thank you. Uh, we have one question from the audience. Nazik, please address your question. Thank you, Akhwal. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering if you are going to look into the skills of women that uh, they obtained during the migration and um, that they're using back in their home countries, uh, back in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, uh, thank you, is it Nazik? Thank you, Nazik, uh, for the question. Yes, uh, migration, the positive part of migration for female migrants is that, uh, like you said, they gain uh, skills, they gain experience. Uh, it helps for the empowerment and also the uh, study, uh, some studies uh, show that uh, upon return, uh, these women may uh, set up their own business and be uh, like more successful in the sectors which were not uh, like uh, successful before, and they can be even more uh, in leading positions. Uh, uh, of course, yes, I will uh, ask that question. I will consider about their background about the education level, so on and so forth, yeah, about the skills and experience. But again, so there is no data or just a little known about this, uh, uh, about uh, integration and adaptation of returned women. So that's why I'm going to study and to know more about that. And also, how many women are you planning to interview? Uh, since I'm going to do narratives, uh, I was suggested like uh, to do a good narratives with 10 respondents will be enough. Yes, thank you. So, um, Gulnara, please, you're first. Uh, uh, Ainura, thank you for your interesting proposal of, uh, of your research. And maybe I missed, sorry, but I want to ask to you about your uh, expected results. What you want to get finally and uh, mm -hmm. in your expectation, uh, uh, can you say about your preliminary maybe policy recommendations? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's obvious there should be in any proposal, yeah? They are for... Uh, thank you in advance for your answer. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Gulnara. Uh, earlier, I presented my proposal and I said it's, I'm just proposing what I'm going to study. My uh, findings are not ready yet. I haven't started data collection yet, but uh, I hope that the results of my study uh, will help or some kind of guide uh, those female migrants who are planning or who are um, thinking to return home on what to expect and how to uh, well adapt and integrate in the uh, home community again. Thank you. Okay, okay well, um, I think it was a really nice discussion and we had many questions that we've discussed. So um, the next presenter is Nurgul. Nurgul Tilenbaeva, she works uh, at the economics department of the American University of Central Asia, and she is also a PhD candidate in development economics. She is uh, almost ready to uh, defend her PhD degree and at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, Switzerland. Her research interests include development economics, behavioral economics, international migration, international trade and child health. And uh, at our session, she's um, presenting a really interesting work uh, on mental accounting, remittances, and celebrations. Margot, you can start to have 20 minutes. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I'm very excited to share the results 
of the topic that I feel really passionate about. So it's called mental accounting remittances and celebrations. Here is the outline of the presentation. Is $1 of remittance income equal to $1 of any other source of income? If we look at the classical economic theory, then there is an economic principle of fungibility which says yes. Uh, it doesn't matter what source of income we are talking about, uh, they will always be equal. Then if we believe that this is the case, that fungibility is indeed in place, then any discussion of the effect of migrant remittances on consumption choices of individuals is irrelevant. However, there is also a con concept called mental accounting uh, that was suggested by Richard Thaler. He was the first one to suggest, uh, who says no, that $1 of remittance income is not equal to $1 of any other source of income, which means that migrant remittances can actually cause some behavioral changes at the household level and hence the development impact can be huge. So because of that, uh, remittances may actually increase investments in human and physical capital, or in contrast, they can be invested in uh, status-oriented conspicuous consumption, for example, celebrations, and may have little impact on local economies. Now, uh, Kyrgyzstan is the number two country in the world after Tonga by its share of personal remittances in GDP. It was 33% in 2018, which makes its economy highly dependent on the money transfers by labor migrants. At the same time, there are frequent claims in Kyrgyz media that remittances sent by migrants are often used to finance celebratory events, which are really numerous and expensive. So according to the estimates, um, Kyrgyz citizens spend around 2 billion US dollars on weddings, funerals, and other ceremonies per year. While, for example, the GDP of the country was 6.87 billion in uh, 2018. And uh, if we look at uh, leak data, uh, most of the households reported spending remittance money on current expenditures, savings, and also wedding. And then uh, we also have the data that uh, more than 10% of the households reported using money transfers from their family members for funding their largest festive event in the past 12, uh, 12 months. However, I will really put these claims into tests. So my research questions are, are remittance income and are the income fungible for Kyrgyz households? Are they perfect substitutes or not? How is remittance income and income from other sources spent? And are there any significant differences in their patterns of spending? And what type of goods the different expenditure categories represent, like normal or inferior? And within normal, are these luxury or necessity goods in response to the increase in remittance income versus other income of Kyrgyz families? So why is this study unique? Uh, to my knowledge, it's the first attempt in the literature to formally test the fungibility assumption using non-experimental data. Uh, I will talk about the methodology later. Then uh, I will be using the system of demand equations that will allow me to both account for different patterns of spending by households, as well as differentiating between various types of goods according to the income source you used. Uh, I also uh, extend the analysis to study distributional effects. So what is the effect if the household is rich and poor, but I will not be sharing these results for the sake of time. It's also one of the first attempts in the field to empirically study the relationship between sources of income and spending on celebratory events. And this is also a contribution to literature on Central Asia and Kyrgyzstan in particular. Now, this topic uh, is very diverse, interesting, and complex. It touches upon several fields of study, one of which is called mental accounting. So what does it mean? It means that individuals have multiple mental accounts where activities are assigned. So expenditures are grouped into categories, for example, housing, food, etc., and spending is constrained by implicit or explicit budgets. What does it mean in the context of my research? It means that first of all, households engage in spending in terms of groups of expenditures rather than individually. It also means that there may be separate remittance income budget and other income budget. And it also means that remittance income and other income are actually not fungible or they are not perfect substitutes. Now, another field of study is the demand systems and uh, many different types of demand systems have been proposed in the literature. And I will be using the working lesser expenditure model and the third field of study is about remittances and its uses. And um, from the point of view of the development impact of remittances, we could differentiate three views in the literature. One is optimistic saying that compared to other sources of income, remittances are actually spent on productive uses. For 
for example, investment in human and physical capital. Uh, there is also a pessimistic view that, uh, in fact, it's the opposite. Uh, remittances are spent on uh, consumption goods. And the third view says that we cannot really discuss uh, whether remittances are spent more on this or that item, because actually remittance income and other income are fungible. So this discussion is irre irrelevant. Now, I'm not going to talk about the migration profile because I think uh, most of the audience is very much familiar with the situation in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, just to say that in general, among those families who have a migrant, uh, they, the share of remittances that they receive, it constitutes a large share of their budget. So there is a potential for money transfers to significantly improve households' well-being. Now, we, I think uh, also the audience here is very much familiar with uh, how numerous and expensive the celebrations in Kyrgyzstan are. Just some numbers. Uh, so for example, the average number of guests served at a funeral remembrance day attended by a household was 227. The average size of bride price was uh, almost uh, $1,500. And the average spending for the sons or any male household members wedding marriage was about more than 2000 US dollars, which are really huge amounts compared to average incomes of the households. And just to show how the uh, how complicated and expensive the, uh, the different festivities are. I just put an example of the marriage process in here. This is just my schematic version of the different steps engaged, like it's a really long process, and the different expenditures that are expected from both sides, from the groom's side and from the bride's side. Now, uh, why do we care about that? Like pe some people may say, like, I don't really care if someone spends a lot of money on the celebrations, like you should let them decide how they want to do their spending. But they pose a serious threat to households welfare. And as a result, even the Korean parliament tried numerous attempts to pass a law similar to the one that is already in place in Tajikistan, that would put some restrictions on the number of guests, number of slaughtered animal, etc. And uh, the reason is that we are afraid that expenditures on festivities may divert the valuable resources away from more productive uses, which could otherwise help households in the fight against poverty. So if we find out that remittances are in fact spent on short-term consumption purposes, like celebratory events, then there is no really a development impact <clears throat> from migrant money transfers. Now I talk about uh, my model. So uh, as a benchmark, I start, I start with the basic working lesser expenditure model, where the dependent variable is the expenditure share of consumption category J in total, and, and the X is total expenditure on all consumption categories. Uh, here I assume that this total expenditure on all consumption categories is represented by expenditures from remittance income and expenditures from other income. If I just put them as log expenditure remittance plus other income, uh, it would not be correct because then I would be assuming that these are perfect substitutes, but this is what I want to test. That's why in order to actually test that, I use, I incorporate the constant elasticity of substitution function in the basic working lesser expenditure model. So I rewrite it in the following way, where the gammas uh, represent the distribution parameters and theta is a substitution parameter. Now, in, in fact, even though there I just put one equation, this is a system of G demand equations, which needs to be solved simultaneously. And I also have to put restrictions uh, for the demand system to be valid. So one restriction is the adding up restriction. It's just from the theory and homogeneity restriction. And because this is a constant elasticity of substitution function, which is a highly nonlinear function, it is estimated using the feasible generalized nonlinear least squares method. So I'm not really interested, even though I do the estimation of the demand system, I'm not interested in the results of the demand systems per se, but I'm interested in them because I want to calculate the elasticity of substitution using the parameter theta that I obtained. And I get it using this formula. And if I find that this uh, sigma is less than one, then remittance income and other income are complements to each other. 
And if it's higher than one, remittance income and other income are substitutes to each other. And fungibility means that ideally remittance income and other income should be perfect substitutes, meaning uh, that uh, the elasticity of substitution should be approaching the infinity. Now, after I've done some rearrangement and derivations, I can get the marginal budget share uh, spent out of remittance income and uh, out of other income. And I can also get the average budget shares. And um, I will need the information for the marginal budget shares to answer the question, if we increase, for example, remittance income by one uh, unit of currency, by how much the expense on different categories of uh, expenditures goes up. Now, so this is the type of question that, that I can answer using the marginal budget shares. And together, uh, I can use these numbers to calculate the respective expenditure elasticities for each consumption category uh, by dividing the marginal budget share by uh, average budget share. And uh, if I find that uh, this psi is higher than zero, then this is a normal good. And uh, if it is less than zero, it is inferior goods. I can even go further and I can see if these are necessity goods or luxury goods. So uh, as Asil, Asil Gul actually mentioned in the first presentation, uh, we might have endogeneity because of selection bias. So households that have migrants abroad and or receive remittances may be different from households that do not have migrants abroad and or do not receive remittances. So we have to take care of that. In, in order to do that, I use a control function approach uh, in the context of um, nonlinear estimation. And the instrumental variables that I use uh, consist of kind of two parts. One uh, type of instrumental question, uh, uh, variables that I use uh, relate to the knowledge of Russian. So uh, I have three options to use, uh, three instrumental variables. One is whether the household head can read, write, and speak Russian whether the household head and his spouse can do that, and percentage of household members who can read, write, and speak Russian. So the idea behind this instrumental variable is that uh, uh, because we know that most of the households who go for migration, they go to Russia, if they know the Russian language well, then we expect uh, them to be placed in better jobs and send higher amounts of remittances to the families left behind. At the same time, whether they, the knowledge of Russian should be exogenous, should have no direct effect on, uh, on how they, on the patterns of spending. And then the next uh, instrumental variable is proportion of households in the community who have migrants abroad. This is something that is frequently used in the literature, so I follow the same approach. And for standard errors, I use bootstrapping using 400 replications. And because in my uh, model specification, I have the logarithm, and there are many households that do not receive remittances, those who do not have migrants. So I have zero values and I cannot take the logarithm of zero. So for that, I use inverse hyperbolic sign transformation to deal with zero values for remittance income. Now I use uh, life and data for 2011 to 13. Uh, I uh, divide the consumption categories to five uh, parts. So food items, education and health, celebrations, funerals, rituals, consumer goods and other goods. And I'm particularly interested in celebrations, funerals and rituals. And remittance income is amount of money transfers from persons living abroad in the last 12 months per month. And income from other sources is all known remittance income per month. Now I also include variables of control that are consistently just routinely included in, uh, in the uh, studies of the similar type. And then here I uh, start the results section. So basically uh, how the results should be read. Basically this first table, I'm not interested in the table itself. Uh, I mean, I'm not interested this is the table that shows the results of my system of demand equations. So the alphas, betas, thetas, gammas, and size, and also the effect of uh, variables of control. But I need this information to further calculate the elasticities of substitution, which will allow me to answer the question. So I will not be really interpreting the results from this table, just to show that uh, uh, I have separate results for food, then uh, it goes on, and then I have for education and health, uh, for celebrations, funerals, rituals, uh, for consumer goods, 
and other goods. So this is just um, a set of uh, results that I will use subsequently. So here, this is the table that I'm interested in. This is the elasticities of substitution between remittance income and other income. So I calculate that using the TED test that I obtained before after estimating the demand equations. And what I find that in most of the cases, the coefficients are precisely estimated. And at the same time, I see, uh, like I can already give an answer to the first research question, whether a remittance income and uh, other income are fungible or if they are perfect, um, substitutes or not. And I see that all the numbers are less than one. It means that in fact, not only remittance income and other income are not perfect substitutes, because in that case, we would require the elasticities of substitution to uh, approach infinity. But even if we don't use such a restrictive uh, definition, uh, we are still in the realm that uh, the elasticity that uh, remittance income and other income are complements to each other rather than substitutes. Now, what does it mean? It means that uh, remittance income and other income are not fungible. Uh, it means that Kyrgyz households view these two sources of income differently and have several uh, separate mental accounts for them or separate remittance income budget and other income budget. It means that mental accounting matters. And because mental accounting matters, now we can actually talk about uh, the discussion of uh, differences in the patterns of spending. The two types of income is relevant. So I go on with that. And first of all, in this table, I calculate the marginal budget shares for remittance expenditure. Uh, you have five minutes. Thank you. So uh, again, I have the different expenditure categories here. And uh, here I have the celebrations, funerals, rituals. And in most of the cases, I see that the coefficients again are precisely estimated apart from education and health. And what can we make of these results is that for one, uh, some increase in the remitted income budget expenditure on, uh, let me focus immediately on celebrations, on celebrations, funerals, rituals, increases by about 0 0.08, if I take the average of the uh, regressions. And uh, education and health by about 0 0.04. The reason I'm also focusing on this is because these are the only kind of investment uh, category uh, in my analysis. So at the margin, money transfers from migrants are spent on consumption goods mostly, which have no long-term benefits for the receiving communities. But this is not it. We still have to compare the marginal budget shares out of remittance income to the marginal budget shares of other income. But before doing that, I also calculate the remittance expenditure elasticities to see if the goods are normal goods or inferior goods. And I find that all consumption categories are normal goods, in particular necessity goods out of remittance income. And then when I look at the marginal budget shares for other expenditure, uh, what I find is that Again, for one some increase in the other income budget, expenditure on education and health increases by about 0 0.06. Uh, remember before it was 0 0.04 and celebrations, funerals, rituals by about 0 0.07. And previously it was 0 0.08. So what does it mean? It means that actually Kyrgyz households spent on education and health more of their other income budget than from their remittance income budget and they spend on celebrations, funerals, and rituals more of their remittance income budget than from their other income budget. So again, I calculate the expenditure elasticities out of other income, and I find that most of the goods are normal goods, but uh, I also find that uh, consumer goods are luxury goods. Now, just to conclude, my first research question was, are remittance income and other income fungible for Kyrgyz households? And we found that in fact, they are not uh, in the eyes of Kyrgyz households. So this assumption fails and therefore mental accounting matters. And it means that migrant money transfers can really cause behavioral changes at the household level and the development impact could have been potentially huge. 
Now, the second research question is how is remittance income and income from other sources spent? And are there significant differences in their patterns of spending? And we see that in line with the pessimistic view in the literature, actually the transfers from migrants are spent on consumption goods mostly, which have no long-term benefits for the receiving communities. So we find that uh, uh, spendings on educational health are actually more of their other income budget than the remittance income budget. And we also find that families spent on celebrations, funerals, and rituals more of their remittance income than their other income uh, budget. So unfortunately, the massive remittance income flows do not have a positive development impact that they potentially could. And then the last research question was about the type of goods uh, that different expenditure categories represent uh, in response to the increase in remittance income or other income. And in, we found that in most of the cases, these are normal goods, so in particular necessity goods. But what is interesting, if households spend uh, other income, uh, on consumer goods, they view them as luxury items. Uh, all right, and that's it uh, from my side. And I will be very happy to hear your questions and comments. Thank you, Nurbur. Um, the audience, if you have any questions, you can raise your hands and ask your questions yourself. Uh, and I already see some people who want to do that. Or you can use the Q&A um, function in Zoom. And Damir already has some questions. I yeah, we... Google, many thanks for your uh, great work. Uh, I think your visualization on how bedding uh, steps uh, should go should be another paper to present because it looks really very complex. Um, I had a few, a couple of technical questions, but also some kind of points you raised to kind of challenge them. So one is, um, which uh, number did you use from LAK given we have, uh, we asked about remittance in two places. So, I mean, definitely we had a choice to ask only once, but also we wanted to make sure that households <clears throat> possibly re forget to report in one place could remember in another place. So it's two numbers are a bit different so um, I think it matters for your analysis so how did you um, overcome that problem um, so one statement you made uh, let me finish with uh, technical things so when you look at uh, weddings uh, celebrations uh, and funerals I think funerals is a bit trickier inside of it yeah so it's not something that households do because they want to do but it's because out of control of that and we know the funerals are expensive and a lot of burden, economic burden on families. So is there a way to kind of remove that? I don't know. I have some ideas we can discuss, but uh, that could be something to take into account if possible. Um, lastly, you said that households spend mostly on consumption and uh, it's not really what leads to development, um, but uh, there is another opinion saying that if there is money coming out, you spend more, you are buying those goods and services from businesses that provide in effect the turnover increases and largely there is aggregate, aggregate kind of um, effect on the whole economy which drives other sectors and therefore not necessarily at household level there is effect but we see effect uh, overall. So think about construction sector, think about services and etc. So uh, I don't know that possibly you are discussing about it, but largely I was not entirely comfortable with saying that uh, if they just spend for food, uh, I mean, next session is going to talk about food and health and education. If you had better food, it's also something that leads to development, but through several uh, several points. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Damir. Uh, those are excellent questions and very valid. Uh, so the first question was about how I, what measure of remittance I used because yes, indeed, uh, there were two places where I could find this number. And uh, in my paper, I used the remittance income that was uh, uh, reported by households in the income 
uh, module uh, of life in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, at this point, I haven't done like a robustness check using the other measure, but that would be, I think, a good idea maybe to do a robustness check using the alternative measure of remittances from the remittances section of uh, LIC. In terms of uh, in terms of funerals, yes, I fully agree that uh, these are quite different. And um, while there is some kind of um, power, decision power for the households to about whether to host some of the festivities, but for the funerals, it's kind of like um, they don't have any other option. They have to hold a funeral. So possibly uh, that would be good to subtract funerals. And I imagine if uh, I use the data from the biggest uh, kind of celebration slash funeral that uh, the household conducted and maybe subtract, that would be one uh, way, but that will not be perfect. Maybe we can still discuss about that um, later on, how we can do that. That would be nice, I agree. And in terms of the development impact, uh, here, again, I, I fully agree with the fact that even though here I talk about the effects within households uh, with, uh, about the decisions they make on what to spend on uh, at the margin. But overall, if we speak about the economy, then uh, for sure, uh, when we are spending on celebrations, then we are supporting the businesses, we're buying their services, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So overall, it has uh, uh, there are good kind of sides, uh, I mean, the development impact. So maybe when I uh, make my conclusions, I make it like less, um, how do I, so I make it with the notes, with a side note that uh, here I'm not uh, talking about the overall effects, but thank you very much uh, for your comments and suggestions. Thank you. I just want to ask Nurgul to talk a bit more about the instrumental variables that you're using, because you have a lot of them. And uh, what do you think about their like validity and how strong they are? Mm -hmm. So um, there are two types of instrumental variables that I used. Uh, one type refers to the uh, knowledge of Russian, just uh, measured in different ways. Uh, the first one is whether the household head speaks Russian well. Uh, the second one, whether the household head and his spouse or her spouse speak Russian. And the third one is percentage of household members who speak Russian. Uh, so the idea behind, um, if I talk about the relevance of the instrument is uh, because we know that most of the households go to Russia uh, to go to Russia to, uh, for migration, then it, it is just uh, logical that those who know Russian well, they may have higher chances of being placed in better paid jobs and hence having a uh, uh, a higher uh, remittance income to be sending to their families left behind. At the same time, if we talk about the exclusion restriction, I, I expect that uh, the knowledge of Russian should have no effect on the patterns of spending of these uh, households. And um, in fact, when I use this control function approach, uh, and I plug in the residuals from the uh, regression when I predict remittance income, then I find this is something like a Hausmann test. And then so, something like, a, we can treat it something like a Hausmann test uh, for uh, whether there is actually endogeneity or not. And when I did that, uh, there was mixed evidence. So sometimes uh, they were statistically significant and sometimes they were not. In terms of the second um, instrumental variable, uh, it's about migration networks. So basically the idea behind is that uh, for migration, it plays a huge role whether if there, if there are communities, I mean, if there are people who you know who are already in Russia, for example, then it will be easier for you to also travel to Russia and to get uh, better paid jobs. And because of that, uh, you may have a higher income to remit uh, to the families left behind. At the same time, because these are community level characteristics, which uh, by the way, I take from the community questionnaire of LIC, then uh, I, I uh, expect this to be exogenous to the patterns of spending of individual households, which I believe satisfies the exclusion restriction. Great, thank you. I think we have one question from the audience, Elisa. Will you ask your question? 
Um, yeah, good, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I would like to thank Limbaeva, Mrs. Limbaeva for, for giving such a very interesting insight in regard to remittance. You know, after 30 years, uh, we talk every time, you know, just we are dependent on remittance, we are dependent on remittance, but we never had an information about how we actually spend this remittance and why we actually um, say that we are, you know, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, depend on remittance. So this is amazing. Thank you very much for that. Um, so what I also like you address, you know, several sectors in which, you know, in the economy where it's actually households spend money uh, on food, on education, on health, um, on, you know, social um, gatherings, such as uh, um, weddings and funerals, you know. And uh, for some, um, I would say depending where you are, you are living, you know, for example, European people would understand that, um, you know, spending on food, education and health is much more important than social gathering. Um, but in Kyrgyzstan, you know, this social gazing has a an, an special value, you know, while attending your uh, speech, I was thinking like, okay, so they are actually spending money for less valued things, you know, but then, you know, I just said, okay, n not really, because this social gazing has also kind of special institution in Kyrgyzstan, you know, and, and um, um, and this is also, I discuss every time whenever in, I'm in Kyrgyzstan, you know, and say, oh, weddings are bad. So why are you spending such, uh, you know, you're going to Russia and uh, working months and then you spend just one, one uh, social gathering. So are you also addressing um, this, um, we'll say, discussion um, in, your, in your research? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Elisa, thank you very much for the excellent question and for the comments. So in terms of uh, social gatherings having an important role, so for example, just as an example from my side, we know that uh, when we have this uh, big network, so we can have kind of like a social safety net, right? So because we don't have a strong state, so we depend a lot on our relatives to help us in difficult times and celebrations are one of the ways to keep up uh, with them, right? Uh, on the other side, um, so that uh, argument is valid for sure. On the other side, when I look at descriptive evidence, whether households thought that festive expenses are reasonable, I found that more than half, uh, as far as I remember, I think it was something like 55% of the households said that uh, festive expenses are unreasonable. Uh, but yet they still spent a lot on that. So I feel like uh, this um, evidence suggests that there is a lot of just societal pressure to uh, spend a lot on the festive events. So, of course, they're welcome to do those, but maybe not spend so much on them. Maybe kind of that's another way to look at that. Uh, and um, uh, what else did I want to say? So because most of the people disagreed that festive expenses are reasonable, uh, I felt like um, many people feel like they are kind of like in a trap almost that they have to spend a lot uh, on the celebrations uh, and other things. Uh, yes, and there was something else that I wanted to say, but uh, I'm, unfortunately I forgot, but maybe we can also uh, keep in touch after the presentation yeah. and, uh, yeah. Yeah, but sorry, may you. I ask one more question, just to, to thank you very much, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. As you say, there are, you know, 50% of the people um, found that spending is unreasonable. It would be interesting also, I mean, uh, for outsiders especially, to see, um, you know, control or not control, but to see if there's the, you know, age thing, you know, it's younger generation who, who found it unreasonable, younger or older generations. And maybe there is, you know, maybe you can somehow track the social change, you know, in regard to some um, institutions that we have in Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. That's it for my side. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Thank so you. in terms of the age variable, 
uh, I did control in the regressions that I ran, I did control for the age of the household heads. And I didn't uh, comment on that, but the result was that, uh, in fact, if the age of the household was bigger, then uh, there was a tendency to spend more on celebrations. Um, that, uh, that was the result that I got. Another thing that uh, I also remembered from what I wanted to say, when, you, uh, when I study the literature on festive events, which in general is very scarce, but uh, when I studied that, there are different uh, kind of theories behind why people spend a lot on celebrations and uh, rituals. One of the things is social pressure. And the second thing is the prestige, right? Uh, and, um, and maybe the other thing is about the networks, etc. So if we are talking about prestige and uh, social pressure, then if we believe that these are indeed the reasons for high spending on celebrations, then maybe uh, the social safety net role uh, is not the most important one. So it is there, but it doesn't play the biggest role, which makes the discussion about uh, kind of uh, huge numbers of spendings on celebration uh, relevant uh, in terms of their development impact for the households. Thank you. We have time only for one more question. Gulnara, please. Okay. Uh, Norgula, thank you. It's very interesting and relatively new, yeah, uh, to consider exactly elasticities. Uh, therefore, it uh, created so many questions, it posed so many questions. And I want uh, to uh, support Dr. Isinaliev because I wanted to say at the beginning that it's very interesting that you grouped uh, different spendings, uh, I mean, uh, toys and uh, 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 funerals, yeah, in one group, because uh, it's obviously that in terms of uh, elasticity and in, in terms of different types of goods, if we say about toys, that means it's considered mostly as uh, luxury good, it's continuation of the discussion and uh, funerals we can see them mostly as necessities, yeah? Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, or maybe as normal would, yeah? And I uh, wanted uh, just to add here that if we say about elasticities, it might, it might be common, yeah? That I think that it will be uh, more relevant and more interesting in the light of different oblasts. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gulnara. So, in terms of the funerals, uh, maybe I'm not yet sure, but because I already have a lot uh, for this research. But in general, yes, it would be a good idea to disentangle the effect of funerals. And in fact, right now I'm working on another research, which is in the early stage where I only look at the funerals because these are unexpected shocks to the household's uh, kind of behavior, uh, I would say. And I look at the effects of funerals and the expenses on funerals, how it affects the child health. But I mean, I'm still in the early age and uh, there are still many things to think about that. Uh, so the discussion about funerals being different from other events uh, is valid for sure. And in terms of oblasts, um, when I run the regressions, I do control. I have the time, I have the dummy variables for each oblast separately. And I do find that, uh, for example, Narin and Talas spent more on average on celebrations and uh, funerals and rituals, which could be, I mean, the discussion of why is out of my scope, but possibly these are kind of more traditional societies who value these uh, types of events more. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I have to stop our discussion here because we are running out of time. So thank you, Nurgul, and thank, I want to thank all the speakers for your presentations. Um, and also, I want to thank the audience for joining us today and for being so active. Uh, I want to remind that the presentation slides will be posted on the conference website after the conference. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, enjoy your evening and stay safe.